So here's the workflow again. Uh, so before I go into what kinds of things we can uh, compute, I'd like to at least fess up to uh, the bits that I was I was hiding. This is what I'll call systematics. So I claimed that that lattice QCD was a systematically improvable approximation to QCD. So it's an approximation in the sense that we put it on a space-time grid and work with a finite number of gauge field configurations. So we already discussed that the number of gauge field configurations can go up and up and up and up and up. So that's trivially improvable. But what about this business of putting it on a grid of finite size? Well, first of all, putting it on a grid. So an important thing to realize, another way to think about this grid, space-time grid that introduces a length scale into the process, is that one over that length scale is like an energy cutoff. There are no energies bigger than one over A in the theory. And if you think about what you know about quantum field theories, you need something like that, right? Quantum field theories have an irritating property of having integrals over momentum that become infinite when you integrate up to infinite energies. So this is actually an ultraviolet cutoff in the theory in practice, which is an answer to the question that wasn't asked but what could be asked, which is how come you're doing a quantum field theory and everything's finite in it? That doesn't usually happen. Well, it does happen. It happens here because you've built in a cutoff. There's a minimum length scale. Rather more prosaically, the, the scale appears in the fact that any dimensionful quantity you compute always appears as a dimensionless version of being whatever power of A multiplied by the thing makes it overall dimensionless. But well, that's rather trivial. And in fact, that's how you determine A. I said, you have to have some experimental input where you just take some quantity from experiment, like the proton mass, and you compute the dimensionless proton mass in your calculation. I haven't shown you how to do that, but you compute it. You divide one by the other, and then you know what your lattice spacing is. But here's the real thing. This is where the approximation comes in. Of course, any quantity you compute at a finite value of the lattice spacing is supposed to be the value you would get in the continuum theory plus a correction. This is just a Taylor series expansion in A. But this, of course, is how this is systematically improvable. If you do your calculation at one value of the lattice spacing, you can repeat it again at a different value of the lattice spacing, ideally finer, and again, and again, however many times you see appropriate, and you will see a trend of whatever quantity you are computing as a function of A, and you can fit it with some function like this and extrapolate to A goes to zero. And if you do that well, using the correct form, you will remove the approximation of having introduced a lattice spacing. So in that sense, it is systematically improvable. There was this question about discretization choice. I sort of answered that already. Um, it's really all about accelerating the, this by making these first order terms as small as possible and also sometimes introducing other symmetries. But let's not linger on this. It's rather dull. What about this finite lattice volume? What a, that's, that's a stranger one. So you can convince yourself that you need a big volume but what scale sets the size of the volume you need? Well, certainly you want the box to be bigger than the longest distance phenomenon in QCD, right? The longest propagation length in QCD. Well, that's inevitably going to be associated with the lightest particle that can propagate a decent distance in QCD. Now, if this was QED, we would be in big trouble because the lightest particle that can propagate over a distance is the photon, and it has zero mass and hence infinite range. And you say, well, gluons just like a photon, it's massless too, but you're screwed. Except gluons are confined. So the lightest particle that can propagate finite distances is actually the pion. Pion is the lightest hadron. And so it's, it's 
Compton wavelength, its propagation length is one over the pion mass. So providing your box is significantly bigger than that length scale, you have captured the longest distance phenomena that can happen in QCD. Okay, you happy with that? Shouldn't be, because it's not true. Um, uh, we'll come back to this later if we have time. It's nearly true. It's almost true. It's true for many, many, many quantities. But if you're perverse and choose to work with certain quantities, it doesn't work. Okay. Then there's this dirty uh, industry secret, which is uh, the quark masses in your Lagrangian are free parameters. You can put whatever number you like in there. But the universe has chosen a value for the quark masses. We don't know why it chose the value it chose. It just did. So the positive spin is, well, you pick whatever you want and study how QCD observables vary with the value of, say, the light quark masses. That's the positive spin. The negative spin is it's really hard to do calculations with the physical quark mass. And basically, it comes down to this determinant of M and this inverse of M. Doing the inversions, the computational time, scales very badly with how small this number is. But computers now are very, very, very fast. So people do do calculations at the physical quark mass. There is still a reason to go away from that to figure out how certain quantities vary with quark mass. But that's sort of that's sort of separate to these things. This is not an approximation unless you choose to interpret your results at an unphysical quark mass to compare to physics. Well, that's unjustified, right? Okay, let's move on. But the point I want to make is. And this sort of comes to the question about trust that was coming up, is should you trust results of a lattice calculation? Trust in that point has many, many, many ingredients to it. Trust at what level? Okay, so trust that, okay, there's always trust that the calculation has been done correctly, but that's true in any theoretical approach. So we'll put that one to one side. Then there's the question of what level of precision do you care about? So you have to decide is the answer at the level of precision that I need or not? Has this been done? And is this effect big enough to impact at the level of precision that you care about? And is this big enough? And has this been accounted for? If the people doing the calculation are trying to get at a quantity precisely, they will do this very carefully. And they will do this very carefully. And they may even do multiple values of M and extrapolate that very carefully. If everything is done carefully, then you should trust it. It should be right, unless a mistake was made. Or unless in if you're saying if something doesn't agree with experiment, if this is done properly and it still doesn't agree with experiment, then you're down to two possibilities, right? Experiment was done wrong. Don't speak it. Never happens. It does happen all the time. Or there's some physics missing. Right. Okay, but let's go on to the quantities that you can compute, and we can come back to this later. So lattice QCD, what can you do with it? Incomplete list, but just a sample. Hadron spectroscopy, compute the masses of stable hadrons. Hadron structure, look inside hadrons by computing operator matrix elements between hadron states. Thermodynamics of QCD, you can actually put the theory at a finite temperature by not having a long time extent of your lattice, but making it short. Turns out that the, the time extent is like the inverse of the temperature. Um, and also importantly, another application, remove unwanted QCD effects. These are all things you do if you're interested in QCD and hadrons. What if you hate QCD? There's this long-standing joke that the lattice community is made up of two different groups of people. One group who love QCD and want to understand how it works, and another group who absolutely despise it because it gets in the way of studying other interactions like beyond the standard model physics. It can do both. So for example, if you're interested in CP violation in heavy quark flavor decays, there's a sector of the standard model where there might be CP violation hiding in the weak sector, in the weak quark sector. 
Problem is those quarks are all confined in hadrons. So you're never going to study their transitions without simultaneously studying QCD. So you better study QCD. Another one that's become very interesting, which I'll show you in a second recently, is the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon, which sounds like it has absolutely nothing to do with QCD whatsoever, but, but it does. And there's many, many more. So let me just go through a few of these and give you a flavor some of the things you can do. This is not even close to encyclopedic. Start with the simplest one, hadron spectroscopy, masses of stable hadrons. So let's go back to two-point functions here, two-point correlation function. So the one you saw before, this, this operator has to be constructed out of quark and gluon fields, because they're the only fields in the theory. So the one you saw before here was psi bar gamma phi psi, which has pseudoscalar quantum numbers. But in general, this could be any color singlet combination of quark and gluon fields with whatever quantum numbers you're interested in. And you, I'm hiding the spatial dependence. I'm just showing the time dependence. So what do you get out of this correlation function? That's the thing you can compute. Well, to see what information is hidden in the time dependence here, first of all, time evolved this operator remembering that we're in Euclidean time. So it's not e to the minus i ht, it's e to the ht, like that. So stick that in place of that. This Hamiltonian hits the vacuum state and generates zero energy. So that comes e to the zero is one, but there's this one lingering in the middle. Okay. Then recognize that the Hamiltonian has a complete set of energy eigenstates. This is the Hamiltonian of QCD, which we never have to write down. We just have to accept that such a thing exists. There are a bunch of eigenstates with fixed energy, and there's presumably a complete set of them. Now, I've written this as a sum deliberately, not a sum and an integral. We'll come back to that in a second. This is correct. It is discrete for reasons you'll see soon. So I can insert that one in here, and then the Hamiltonian is hitting one of its energy eigenstates, which will turn it into an energy. And we're left with this. The correlation function is just a sum over states with each one having a decaying exponential with the decay controlled by its energy. And these prefactors, well, this has a simple interpretation. This is how good is that particular operator at interpolating this particular state from the vacuum? So in a sense, how much does this operator look like this particular hadron state? For some hadrons, it will be big. For other hadrons, it will be small. But in a sense, you might not care about these numbers. You want this. You want to know the energy or mass of some stable hadron state. And that's embedded in the time dependence of this correlation function, which we can compute using the techniques shown in the last lecture. So notice, for large times, all of these exponentials are decaying, but one is decaying slowest. That is the one with the ground state energy in it. So at large times, this correlation function should become a single exponential whose, whose decay rate is controlled um, by the ground state energy. And there's a, there's a cute little operation you can do that shows this explicitly called an effective mass, but we don't need to linger on that. But clearly, if you can get the correlation function at large times from the rate of decay, you can get out the mass of the lightest state with the quantum numbers of the operator that you wrote down. So in our previous case, pseudoscalar quantum numbers, the lightest hadron with pseudoscalar quantum numbers is the pion. So from this calculation, you would get out the pion mass. What do they look like in practice? This is a real lattice QCD two-point correlation function. As a function of time, here I've taken the correlation function and multiplied it by the ground state energy dependence in order that it not just look like a precipitously falling exponential, which is very hard to see anything from. So this should become flat if I've got the energy right, and it does. So what do you see here? You see there's still exponential decay here. Well, that's the contribution of the other exponentials in this sum, which are decaying away. But notice that the error bars grow. What are the error bars here? This is the variance, right? For every time slice, for every value of time, we have averaged over the, all the gauge field configurations. 
to get the mean value, but we can also compute the variance, and that gives us an error bar. And indeed, here, here's one particular time slice, and just to show you, this is the distribution of the y-axis values as a histogram over the gauge field configurations. So you see it's a nice Gaussian, nice Gaussian distribution, as you would hope. What you see is that typically, as time increases, the statistical noise increases. This is a general property of these kinds of, of calculations. So you have to get good at getting information at, at earlier times. But the story is you can get the mass of the lightest hadron in any given quantum number out of a procedure like this. And this has been an industry for, for decades now. Here's a summary plot made by uh, Andreas Kronfeld from Fermilab, where he shows many, many, many lattice calculations of the pi on mass, the rho mass, the k on mass, the k star mass, the eta mass, the eta prime mass, the omega, the phi, the n, the lambda, the sigma, the psi, blah, 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 right? And the black lines are the experimental values, and the different points are different lattice calculations computing these things. Now, I don't want you to look at this in detail too much, except to see that most of the time these points lie right on top of the experimental values, indicating that indeed these first principles calculations can reproduce things we already know from experiments. Okay. Yeah, I actually don't remember uh, what the color what the color scheme is. I think they're different discretizations and different amounts of caution over whether um, the A goes to zero limit is being done. I'd have to go and check in the paper. That level of detail isn't, uh, I don't remember. And, and this stuff is interesting, but don't ask me now. Why, why are these terrible? I can tell you about that. But let's move on, because I want to get through all this and leave plenty of time for questions at the end. What about hadron structure? What about poking inside of a hadron? And here, operator matrix elements are what you want. But ultimately, well, okay, so here's an example. One example. I'm picking the pion again, because the pion's nice. No spin, lightest particle, simplest. So the pion has an electromagnetic form factor, right? You can, you can have this process where you probe the charged pion with a photon, and depending upon the virtuality of the photon, Q squared, uh, you get a form factor, which tells you something about the spatial structure of this particle. And where does it appear? Well, it appears something like this. So here's the pion state, and here's the vector current, which in quantum electrodynamics is what couples to the photon. So, so this quantity gives you this pion form factor. So if you can compute these matrix elements, you can get access to this structural quantity. So how do you get at that in a lattice calculation? Well, you need a correlation function. And what you need this time is not a two-point correlation function, but a three-point correlation function. So here, look, psi bar gamma phi psi, then this vector current, then another psi bar gamma phi psi, three different times, time zero, time t, time delta t. And what are these bits doing? That's creating the pion quantum numbers, that's inserting this vector current, and that's annihilating the pion quantum. So this is just like the two-point function we did before, except instead of making the pion, letting it propagate through time and then annihilating it, we make the pion, let it propagate through time, blast it with a vector current, let it propagate through time and then annihilate it. That's what we're doing there. And the same sort of time evolution and in inserting complete sets of states that we did in the two-point function will give us something like this. So this looks very complicated, but you can see, look, it's got the exponential time dependences like we had before. Now there's two time variables to deal with, the insertion time and the annihilation time. There's these matrix elements again that tell you how good your operator is at producing a pion, but they're no problem because you got those for free out of your two point calculation that you did on the previous slides. So you got those numbers and you got the pion mass. The only thing you haven't got in this expression is the thing you want, which is this matrix element. So by computing this three point function, you get access to this. Well, okay. What about that? 
Well, of course, the point is when you insert the complete sets of states, it's not just the pion that you insert, it's all the other hadron states that have the same quantum numbers as the pion as well. And they will have different time dependencies that are decaying exponentially. So do you need to worry about them or not? Well, it, as, is, as is unfortunately often the case in science, it depends, right? So in terms of computing this thing, just to make it clear, this isn't really that much harder than computing the two-point function. Here's the cartoon. Instead of an M inverse and an M inverse, we have an M inverse, an M inverse, an insertion of this, and then another M inverse. It's the same basic idea. So here is a real lattice calculation of a three-point function like this one. And what, I've, what I'm showing you here is I've taken the three-point function, I've divided this number, which I know, I've divided this number, which I know, and I've, I've multiplied out the exponentials so that there should be no time dependence left if there is just this first term and nothing in the ellipses. Right? So this would be flat if only the pion and no excited states were contributing to this correlation function. And here it is with delta t fixed to 28 and all t's in between zero and 28. And what you can see is it has a flat region in the middle. So there is indeed a region where we propagate far enough away from zero that practically all the excitations of the pion have exponentially decayed away. And similarly from 28 at the other end, and there's a region where we're left with just the pion in the middle. And we can fit that and that will give us this matrix element. So in this case, the ellipses, in a sense, don't matter because we can see that we don't need to consider them. We can just ignore them because they've decayed away. But when I say it depends, what if we'd chosen delta t to be smaller? So here we did that, delta t of 16, delta t of 12. You see, in these cases, there is no flat region. You never reach a region in time where all the excited stuff has decayed away. And if you're going to do that, then you're going to have to fit these exponentials, fit the time dependence of these exponentials to something like a constant plus an exponential decaying from here, which you can see there, and an exponential decaying from here. And that constant should be equal to this if you do it right. And you see it, it basically is. But this is a source of systematic error. So this is another thing where should you trust the results? If it's something like a, a hadron structure calculation, make damn sure they've really well constrained the contribution of excited states. That's a potential source of systematic error. And you can see here, it's horrible, right? Really short time. You see all the points have got tiny error bars because errors grow with time separation. So there is a reason to go to small times if you want statistically very, pri very precise points. But this is, you know, this is, uh, this is a you know a fool's economy, right? You appear to have gotten something better, but you've just traded off for systematic errors associated with the excited states, which are, may or may not be controlled. In this case, they appear to be quite well controlled. But let's suppose you've done this pretty reliably. You get a nice flat value there. By, by choosing different values of momentum here at source and sink, which I'm suppressing here, but you can see them here, I can get at different virtualities of the photon, different off shellnesses of the photon, which we represent by this Q squared value. And here are time dependences for different choices of P, just showing you that they sort of can all be well described and giving you the form factor of the pion as a function of that virtuality, which of course we should plot like this, form factor versus Q squared. You see it falling off like you expect form factors to do. Now, honesty, this calculation, I just chose one of my own because I have the nice plots and I can, I can talk to them without making any errors. This is actually a calculation done with quark masses, which are completely wrong, way too heavy. This doesn't look anything like the real pion, but it's still the same structure that a real calculation uh, would have. And in fact, I'm not using psi bar gamma five psi here because I've got self-respect. I'm using something much more sophisticated that I don't have time to explain to you. Um, but the point you see is you get 
a discrete sampling of the Q squared dependence of the pi on form factor. Now you might say, well, that's a bit weird. Why is it discrete? Why can't you just pick whatever continuously distributed momenta you want and get a curve here? Well, the point is you can't. Because what I didn't mention to you when we made that uh, finite volume discretization of our grid, we have to put boundary conditions on this box. And the boundary conditions we choose are periodic. In a periodic box, you can't have just any momentum you want. You can only have momentum in integer multiples of two pi over the length of the box, right? You have to fit complete numbers of wavelengths into the box. So you can't give these pions just whatever momentum you want. You can only give them integer multiples of two pi over L, and that's why you have discrete points. But that's fine. You know, you can still fit this with some curve to, to get the dependence in between. So this is how you do structure calculations. And of course, you don't, you're not limited to just the vector current. You can do all kinds of fancy currents there. And people these days are looking at um, parton distribution functions and GPDs and TMDs by putting very, very fancy operators here. But the same technique essentially works in terms of computing three-point functions and pulling out the time dependence. It's the same basic idea. Okay, I'm going to skip over the thermodynamics because I'm relatively short on time. And to be fair, I don't know what I'm talking about on that topic. I don't wish to imply that I do know what I'm talking about in the other topics, but I am very confident I don't understand the thermodynamic stuff. What about this business of removing unwanted QCD effects? So I want to illustrate this with mu on G minus two, because this is an incredibly uh, fashionable topic. So you, you probably heard about this. This is really a high energy physics thing rather than a nuclear physics thing. But uh, the idea is that uh, the muon, when it interacts with a photon, part of its interaction is to measure its magnetic moment. And you know that in the Dirac theory, the magnetic moment of a, of a fermion should have value two, but that experimentally, the electron and the muon have a value of magnetic moment that isn't two, it departs from it. And famously, this is related to, you know, um, like, loop corrections in QED generate corrections to this too. For the case of the muon though, there's this, there's this observation that when this is measured and compared to what you believe the standard model says should be in this blob, there appears to be a discrepancy between the two. And that gets people very excited as they say, if there's a discrepancy that indicates that the standard model is incomplete and there must be new particles we haven't thought of living in this blob. But of course that only works if you have very, very, very precisely computed what the standard model contribution to that blob is. And the bits of that are more or less easy. The quantum electrodynamics bit is relatively easy in quotes because it's perturbation theory. It's perturbation theory to huge orders, but it's just perturbation theory. The problem is there's QCD in there. There are hadrons inside that bubble. So here's a, one example. This is called the vacuum polarization. One of the muons spits out a photon. Some stuff happens, and the photon goes back to a photon absorbed by the other muon. This is, this is inside that blob. And what can be inside this blob? Well, quarks and gluons, or hadrons, equivalently. So in order to compute the value of this blob, you need a non-perturbative method to handle QCD. And the lattice can do that. So there's a major industry right now in precisely computing the QCD contributions to diagrams that appear in the muon uh, anomalous magnetic moment. And I don't want to uh, linger too much on the details, but essentially it boils down to computing a two point correlation function, which the lattice is very good at. And here people have very, very precisely computed these things. And you see over here, different groups using slightly different techniques with slightly different amounts of control over the systematics. And this is also slight, a few years out of date, but at least in a sort of first round of calculations, you can see that they basically all agree with each other, which is what you want to see. 
this is this is this is the whole problem is is under under contemporary study and people are working very hard to get complete control over all the systematics. This is time. This is the same time you were seeing in the in the previous Euclidean correlation function time. Okay. So how long do I have? When should I stop? Okay, so I, I'm not going to take all that time, so there'll be plenty of time for questions. Um, because I want to uh, I want to say what you can't do with Lattice QCD. But of course, as a member of the Lattice QCD union, this has to be a trick, right? You have to anticipate that I'm actually going to show you something you can do, but it just looks like you can't do. They'll kick me out if I if I if I imply that it can't solve all problems. Um, so it looks like you can't study scattering of a hadron off a hadron, and that's bad because that's something you really 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 want to be able to study because most of what we know about hadron spectroscopy is about unstable resonances. So things like the delta baryon is a classic example, right? Fire a pion at a proton. It'll have this, as a function of energy, it'll have this big bump in it called the delta baryon, and then that decays to a pion and a, and a proton. So that's scattering, that's hadron-hadron scattering, and it's a continuous spectrum process, right? The energy there is continuous. So to study scattering, you have to have access to a continuous energy spectrum. But what I showed you was that in Lattice, I claimed that we only have discrete energy states, not a continuum. And that's true. You only get a discrete spectrum. That's because you're in a finite volume. Take any quantum mechanical system you like, put it in a finite volume, you will get a discrete spectrum only. And it comes to that business of the momentum, right? You can't have just any momentum you want. You can only have the momenta which are consistent with the boundary conditions. So let me try to explain that in a bit more detail. Think about scattering in one-dimensional non-relativistic quantum mechanics. So here I've cooked up some silly potential. So this is some potential describing the interaction between two identical bosons that can move along a line. Okay? And I, I just cooked it up, it doesn't matter. But it's of a finite range. It's got a well and a lip. And if I, if I gave this to you, if you work hard enough, you can solve the Schrodinger equation, right? You might have to do it numerically, but you can do it and you'll get a spectrum out of it. And what will you get? You'll almost certainly get some bound states because it's got this deep well in it. So you'll get some discrete bound states. But then for positive energies, you'll get a continuum of positive energy states. It's just like the hydrogen atom. Hydrogen atom has a bunch of discrete electron proton bound states, but then it has a scattering continuum above it where you bounce electrons off the proton. It's just the same. And you can also solve for the scattering amplitude up here if your quantum mechanics is strong enough. And you, for example, because this has got a lip in it, you can get resonances. Right? You can get you can get something where if this lip was higher, there would be a real bound state here, but it can tunnel out, which gives you a resonance. This is sort of pretty typical non-relativistic scattering behavior. There could be a resonance there. So how does this stuff get parameterized? Well, you know, the way you do it is you think about the wave function outside the range of the potential, and you know that in complete generality, it can be written as a free particle wave function that has been shifted in phase. That's the completely general wave function outside the range of a potential. And that phase shift contains all there is to know about the scattering process. It's completely standard scattering theory. And if you have a resonance, that phase shift as a function of scattering momentum will have this S-shape structure. It's rapid rise through 90 degrees, saturating at 180 degrees which gives rise to that bump in the, in the amplitude. So I hope this is all basically conceptually familiar. This is what scattering looks like. But what if you put the system in a box, a box of length L? And I'm going to choose 
to put it in a box by putting periodic boundary conditions so that L over two is equal to minus L over two. Those points join together, right? Like an old Pac-Man game. If you go off the end here, you come back in on the other side. You are all like solid 30 years too young to know what Pac-Man is. So if you laughed at that joke, you were showing that you have retro tastes. Um, so the point is once you put these boundaries on there, now you've got additional boundary conditions that you didn't have before. In particular, the wave function and its first derivative have to be continuous across that boundary. And what that means is an additional constraint to be applied to this wave function. And that constraint takes the following form. You can do this yourself, this is trivial. Just take derivative of that, plug it into there, you will get this out in a couple of lines. So what does this equation say? Oh, excuse me. This says you can't have just any momentum you want. You can only have momenta that satisfy this equation because they're the only ones compatible with the boundary condition. So you can see that this sort of works because imagine there was no potential at all, then the phase shift would be zero. Second term wouldn't be there. And this would be back to just momentum being integer multiples of two pi over L. But this is here. And what this tells you is, if you have a way to get these discrete momenta to compute them, you can infer the value of the phase shift at that momentum. This is what the spectrum would look like. Discrete value of momentum, same thing as a discrete value of energy. So in place of your continuum, you have a discrete spectrum that presumably you can compute through some numerical technique. If you have it, you can relate it to the phase shift. And this is showing you that you can access scattering in a finite volume, but in an indirect way. It is hidden in the energies of these discrete energy levels, which depend upon the volume that you put the system into. And so in this way, we can get at scattering amplitudes in lattice QCD. Now, this is non-relativistic one-dimensional quantum mechanics. And you will quite rightly say to me, QCD is a three plus one dimensional relativistic field theory. It is, but conceptually, the same thing is true. There is an equation which is analogous to this called the Lucia equation, which deals with all the differences between these two different theories. But conceptually, it's just the same. If you can get the finite volume spectrum, you can get access to the scattering amplitudes. So can you do this? Here is a real lattice calculation where I'm showing you energy levels, discrete energy levels. So where do these come from? Well, you remember two-point correlation functions have the energies appearing in these decaying exponentials. So this is not just the ground state, but also multiple excited states. They can be got at. Actually, not just by computing one two-point correlation function. You have to work much harder than that. I don't have time to explain it, but, but it, it can be done, and it leads to these points with the tiny error bars that you see on them. So this is, this is a system where the quantum numbers of the operators I used look like a pair of pions. They have the same quantum numbers as a pair of pions overall at rest, um, but with vector quantum numbers. Okay, so overall, you think of it as angular momentum one. So I've got these discrete energies, just like these. I push them through the formula analogous to this, and I get the phase shift as a function of energy in, in weird units that I'm not telling you. And so from that energy level, I get that phase shift value. And from that energy level, I get that phase shift value. And we call success, right? Well, not really. I mean, that tells us basically nothing. I have absolutely no idea of what the phase shift is doing in between those points. So I'm going to need more information if I'm going to make any progress. Uh, it turns out you can get more information by computing the system in moving frames. So actually not having the two pions be overall at rest, having the two pions be moving with respect to the fixed lattice. So this is a bit technical. You don't need to worry too much about it, but you can see the spectrum changes 
depending upon how many how much momentum you give to the system. And basically, you get a bunch more points at different energies, so more constraints. Each of those points, you push through that finite volume formula, and you don't just have that point and that point. You map out this smooth curve. And so what you're seeing here, this is a resonance-like behavior, right? This is this S-like curve. This is showing you that in QCD, when two pions scatter off each other, there is a resonance with vector quantum numbers. Well, that's not a great discovery. We've known that for a long time. It's called the Rho resonance. But here it is coming out of a first principles QCD calculation. We did not use the fact that we knew there's an experimental Rho resonance. It just came out. So this is the kind of thing that can be, that can be done to study scattering in lattice QCD. The last thing I want to say before I take whatever questions you might have, is on this topic, uh, I've got to be honest about this. This is the easy, this is the easy case. The row, the row basically decays into pi pi and nothing else. Most of the hadrons, the excited hadrons that anyone is interested in, don't just decay into one final state. They decay into loads of stuff with different branching ratios. And so you have to study what's called coupled channel scattering. This is elastic scattering. You fire two pions in, you've only got enough energy that what will come out at the end is still two pions. What if you've got more energy? Well, then if the two pions come in with more energy than twice the mass of the kaon, they could turn into a pair of kaons. It's coupled channel scattering. And coupled channel scattering can get weird fast. So the row plotted in this way as, as an amplitude, the row would just look like a nice smooth bump. And you probably learned about a bright Wigner, the whole, you know, this wonderful mythical function, the bright Wigner, all resonances that go flat, 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 beautiful bump, flat, flat, flat. All resonances look like that, right? Right, right? No, they don't, not at all. So this is pi pi scattering in S wave, going up in energy to the place where the, K-on anti k -on threshold opens up, and then the eta eta threshold opens up. And this is experimental data. And you tell me what's going on in that plot. Absolutely no idea. Right? I mean, if you have got an idea, you're doing very well, but it's probably wrong because this data is very old, older than I am, and it has been incorrectly interpreted more times than you would like to mention, right? It's clearly very complicated, right? There's one way of viewing it, this red curve here, the pi pi scattering data, is it's got this very broad bump on top of which a sharp dip has been inserted, right? You would say the only sharp feature here is a sharp dip. So clearly this is complicated. Right? It's not easy to interpret. But here's the rub about lattice QCD as opposed to models. People have been trying to model this for decades. Lattice QCD doesn't care about your models. It is not interested. Because if you do it properly, it just has to duplicate this. It just has to give you this back. And if it doesn't give you this back, you've done something wrong or the experiment. So it's, it's, not, it's not your friend. Lattice QCD is not, you know, your caring buddy who rubs your back when you're feeling upset. Lattice QCD is, is a harsh, is a harsh mistress, right? It is, it is giving you the answers whether you like it or not. Okay, so there you go. I'll put you off ever doing any lattice calculations. But what I want to show you is that we can get things that look like this. So we haven't actually done the calculation that would directly duplicate this, but I could, for example, do the same scattering sector but with light quark masses that are heavier than the real light quark masses. So what would this experiment look like if somebody broke into the control room of the universe and took the up and, up and down quark masses and made them several times larger and re we reran the experiment? Okay. So that is a legitimate version of QCD. It just happens to be the one not manifested in this universe, but it's still QCD and it's still worth looking at, I claim. So here's a real calculation. In this world, the pion mass is nearly 400 MeV. 
V. So this is like three times the correct pi on mass. And here I'm showing you that we can get these discrete finite volume energies. You probably would have believed me because you saw this previously. What I want to show you here, without explaining this, this you should view as just being an indication of how hard this calculation is. Because I bothered to make a complicated looking histogram associated with it. That means it must have been a lot of work to justify making that. But the story's kind of the same. These points ultimately are controlled by the scattering amplitudes. It's just that the scattering amplitude now is not one function, but it's a matrix of functions. It's the amplitude for a pi pi system to scatter into pi pi, for a pi pi system to scatter into kk bar, for a pi pi system to scatter into eta eta, and then for kk bar to go to kk bar and so on and so on and so on. So it's what's called a T matrix. It contains all the information about the amplitudes for any given channel to turn into any other given channel. And the problem is that all the information hidden in this matrix is present in determining each individual energy. So it's not easy to do an inversion problem. Each energy depends upon all the elements of that matrix. So this is where you have to know a bit of physics and you have to be willing to parameterize the energy dependence of this, but it can be done. And just to show you, this is sort of the level of constraint that we get. These are finite, this is now done at three different volumes. So we put our same lattice system into different box sizes. And you notice the energies are indeed dependent on the volume. And you get as many points as you can. And each one provides some level of constraint onto the scattering amplitude. You parameterize your T matrix. You use the analog of this Lucia formula I mentioned before. And here's an example. These orange curves are a particular T matrix as description of these points. And you see that it does a really good job, chi squared less than one. So you can find a T matrix that describes all these finite volume energy levels that came out of first principles QCD calculation. And then the question is, what does that T matrix look like? That is your, hopefully, QCD prediction of what this scattering system looks like. And this is what it looks like. So the, the error band here is, is reflecting the, the you know, finite number of gauge field configurations as it was everywhere else. So look at this in red again is pi pi goes to pi pi. It's smooth apart from a dip appearing at kk bar threshold. It's not as sharp as the dip that we got in experiment. But remember, this is not supposed to agree with experiment because we're computing at the wrong light quark mass. So it shouldn't be exactly the same. It may share some similarities. And then look at when, when KK bar threshold opens, it turns on rapidly, an amplitude that turns on very quickly. And nothing much happens in E to E to. Well, that was the same in, in the experiment. So in Lattice QCD, you can do really quite sophisticated studies of scattering uh, and, and produce things that are just as complicated looking. Perhaps that's all I'll conclude from this. It is just as complicated looking as the thing in experiment that we didn't understand. Now we get something out of lattice that we don't understand. Now, if I had longer, if I had another hour, I would, I would go into how, in fact, we can understand this. But that would be less about lattice QCD and more about understanding scattering theory. So that will throw us off topic a little bit. So yeah, so I think, I think I'll end there by showing you, by having shown you uh, a few different applications of lattice QCD, including some quite complicated contemporary ones. And then I've left enough time, hopefully, for some questions. Uh, why does this work for this assumed pion mass? Why does it work? Why does, how can you be able to predict the shape while assuming a pion mass to be that high? I don't, why, I don't understand the question. Why does it work? Why does it work? Okay, if I if I give you a if I give you a potential and tell you to solve the Schrodinger equation for a mass of 
uh, one MeV and then tell you to solve it again for a mass of two MeV, why does two MeV work? It's the yes. same question. My question is, it's, it's known what is pi on mass. Uh -huh. And then you're assuming it to be like three times higher than that. Ah, so no. So what I'm actually doing. So this is when I said um, tune the parameters in the in the QCD discretization. So I insert a certain number into a parameter which is related to the light quark mass, and that parameter that I've inserted is not the correct value for the light quark mass in this universe. It's sometimes bigger. When I then, on those lattices, compute what the pion mass is, this is what comes out. So I have calculated here a version of QCD in which the strange quark mass has the, approximately the right physical value, but the light quark mass, for my own perverse reasons, is several times bigger than it actually is in experiment. But that theory that I write down, that is still QCD. It's just a different QCD. The quark masses in QCD QCD are not set by QCD. They're set by something else. We don't know what. They're, they're the Yukawa coefficients in Higgs theory. We don't know where they come from. I've just chosen a different value. I could choose it to be whatever I like. It's still QCD. It's just not our, it's not this universe's QCD. Does that make sense? No? Uh, I don't know of another way to... I understand right. your point, but it's not convincing enough to believe in this. Sorry. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, is QED confining in lattice QED? Uh, yeah. So QED, inter interesting question. QED is uh, QED is extremely challenging. So the problem with there's a there's an important qualitative difference between QED and QCD, of course, which is that QCD is asymptotically free. QED isn't. So this is this statement that I made about what's the range of interactions in QED. Well, it's infinite. So you actually can't really easily put QED in its naive form on a lattice because you will need an infinite volume to do it. So actually studying QED in a, in a lattice formulation is not easy. And in fact, there are places where you want to do it, because if you're really going for precision in certain calculations, you want the effect of the electromagnetic field to be present, right? So for example, a classic example would be, if you really, really care about the, the difference between the mass of the neutron and the proton, then you know that that's got two contributions. It's got a contribution from the fact that the up quark and the down quark have slightly different masses, well, you can deal with that in the lattice calculation. You just put different masses in for the two quark fields. But a large part of that splitting actually comes from electromagnetic interactions, which are different inside the neutron versus the proton. So if you want to include that in a lattice calculation, you have to get quite clever about how electromagnetism is included. And I'm a long way from being an expert on that. So, um, I perhaps wouldn't want to say too much because I'll make a mistake. Is it on? Ah. Yeah, the deep and the threshold KK bar. Yeah, yeah. So, so actually, um, this is interesting. We've seen it in other places as well. Uh, and it's the same explanation as the experimental data. So if I have the experimental data as well. So, so you will know well, I've, but for everyone else, the, the modern explanation of what's happening here is there are actually two resonances in play. There's something called the sigma, which is a very broad resonance, which is giving rise to this slow motion uh, across here. And then there's another resonance called the F0980, which appears right at the threshold, and it's generating this dip. And the reason it's a dip is before the KK bar threshold opens, you are constrained by what's called elastic unitarity. And that is essentially the statement that the phase shift can only lie, it's an angle, right? And so basically, if you're, if you're already reaching the maximal amount of scattering, you can't add more scattering to it. You have to subtract from it. And so it's forced to be the case that when these two resonances overlap, it has to appear as a dip. Uh, and, and essentially, whoops, 
Essentially, it's the, it's the same thing over here. The only slight difference is over here, something funky has happened where the sigma is not a broad resonance. It's actually a stable bound state lying below threshold, but it's still producing a smooth fall off like behavior onto which a dip gets, gets superimposed. Yeah, it's, it's really, it was, in retrospect, it was predictable, but we still didn't know it was gonna look like this. Um, you said you made lattice cal calculations for this uh, pion mass that, that's three times bigger. Why haven't you made for the actual masses on our universe? For, 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 this, for this particular calculation, so this is not a translationally invariant statement for other kinds of calculations, but for this particular calculation, the, the, the reason is, is twofold. First of all, we, as of yet, we don't have any gauge field configurations with the correct value of the light quark mass computed. We are generating those as we speak. Well, actually, they are computed, but we haven't got all the propagators yet. But there's a good physics reason, actually, why this would be very difficult. Um, so, so this is in stupid units, so it's hard to uh, show. But OK, so, so the pion mass in stupid units here is 0 0.07, okay? which, of course, we could have guessed because the threshold is at 0.14. So look, we are going here. This is twice the mass of the pion. Four times the mass of the pion is going to be 0.28. That's way out here. So this is whole energy re in this whole energy region. All that can happen is that two mesons scatter into two mesons. There might be two pions, two kaons, two eaters. There isn't enough energy for two pions to turn into four pions. Now go to the real world. In the real world, the pion is 140 MeV. So threshold is at 280. Four lots is whatever that is, 560. We would be stuck to just computing in that region. Now you will ask why? Why can't you go above the four pion threshold? The fact is that the formalism that relates the finite volume energy levels that I've been showing you to the scattering amplitude so far exists only for two particles scattering into two particles. It is being worked on, and there is now a formalism involving three particles. So we can go a little bit further, but that's all being tried out at the moment, and people are checking that they can do it. So there is a good physics reason to not do that calculation right now because you just you wouldn't get much that's useful out of it. Uh, what is the perspective like from the finite vo volume formalism? I would mean to access more inclusive uh, observables. Yeah. So so I, so to to phrase the question differently, I think this is this is the idea that. So for example, uh, maybe you don't want to split this up into all of the possible final states. You know, Experimentally, there are inclusive processes where people are just essentially, you don't care what the final state is, right? You just look for a particular initial state. Um, in, in, the fight, in the straightforward finite volume formalism, it's basically not possible. There are arguments made that certain correlation functions can be related to spectral densities that are related to inclusive properties. But this formalism is nowhere near far enough along. And it, and it appears to me to be reliant upon working in huge volumes so that you have a quasi continuum of scattering states. And it's not at all clear to me that that's um, realizable in contemporary calculations. But I have been wrong many times before. I was wrong about, about this Lucia formalism. I was convinced that it was not work properly, but it does. So maybe don't listen to my projections for the future. Listen when I show things that have been done in the past. Thank you. I have seen in condensed matter, some people are using like hexagonal lattice or something. Yeah. Will there be any advantages for us to use? So there was, there was, briefly, um, there was briefly a fashion for um, using these lattices that were the symmetry of this graphene. Remember this, this graphene stuff that's like layers of graphite? I think that's hexagonal or something yeah. like that, right? So there was a brief, there was a brief fad 
for trying to do this and it basically didn't work very well. So the problem of using anything other than a cubic lattice is, is basically just simplicity, right? When you try in, in, in the higher dimensional space, when you try to come up with geometries that are convenient, it's really hard to find them. And if you, in particular, you also have to think about the boundary of your lattice, right? And you've got to have something like periodic conditions on the outside of your lattice. If you start thinking about some funky geometry, it's very hard to have a simple boundary. And if you haven't got a simple boundary where you can do something like periodic boundary conditions, then you're gonna to struggle to define momentum eigenstates. And momentum eigenstates are pretty important. So people have tried other geometries but nothing stuck and pretty much everyone works on some variant on cubic. What, what we do in our calculations, actually, we don't quite do hypercubic. We have a different lattice spacing in time than in space. So we have sort of what you call that a hypercuboid or something, right? Um, and that proves to be uh, helpful, but makes the calculations much more complicated. Thank you. Okay, welcome. And just to be clear, something I should have said, this business of putting the system on a cube is not without its problems. You don't have rotational symmetry anymore. So you have to do a whole load of group theory on properties of rotations of a cube, which for some people is great because some people love group theory. For others, are, you just have to live with it. Uh, well, it's good. My next question is very related to that. Um, how do we know that? optical lattice size, you should applaud that the size of the lattice influenced the energy you got from the calculations. So the volume? Yeah, yeah, the volume. So, right, so that's right. So, so this is 16 cube, 20 cube, 24 cube. So the first thing is I can't go any smaller because if I go any smaller, I'll be hitting this one over m pi problem and then all kinds of physics gets, gets broken in really, really bad ways. Uh, what about going to, to larger volumes? Well, of course I can, but it, it's just trivially computationally more expensive because there are more sites, the matrices are bigger, everything costs more. So the question is, do I need to? What would I get out of going to a bigger lattice? And in the, in the current case, I don't need it. I've got enough constraint. In fact, to, to quote, to quote uh, a reviewer of a piece of our work, the Hadron Spectrum collaboration goes far beyond what any reasonable person would expect is necessary to prove their point. This, you can probably just see it down here. The parameterization we used to describe all these points had eight free parameters in it, but we are constraining with 57 energy levels. We don't need any more in this case. So, so what size do you need? It's, it's a balance between what, what you think will give you enough constraint and what you can computationally afford to do. But then we can kind of estimate whether we, are, we have enough or not. Yeah, so, so something I didn't tell you was what these lines are on here. So these lines represent what the spectrum of the system would look like. Remember, this is two pions. This is what the energy of two pions would be if there were no residual interactions between the two pions. So this is just, uh, well, in this case, for example, this is just twice the square root of m pi squared plus two pi over L squared, which is the energy of two pions if they have back-to-back -back one unit of allowed lattice momenta. So we have these curves without doing any uh, calculation. So we know roughly where the energy levels are going to lie. We know roughly how many energy levels there will be in a given um, energy region. So before we do the calculation, we have some idea how much constraint we're going to have. Okay, thanks.